All right, welcome to Tax Tuesday. If you're looking for Tax Tuesday, you're in the right place. If you're looking for Tax Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you're, well, you could probably watch recordings. So you could still be in the right place. Hey, this is Toby Mathis. Elliot Thomas. And we're going to bring some tax knowledge to the masses today. So it's very exciting. Elliot here is a tax attorney, though he doesn't put that after his name. I have to put the big <laughs> ESQ to make sure that I don't even know what that means. Esquire. Yeah, it means gentlemanly or something. It means something. <laughs> That's why I can't use it. You can, yeah. <laughs> you put JD. What else could you put after the end? Attorney, mm -hmm. counselor. Anyway, we're done with that. Tax Tuesday rules. Since we're say, two lawyers, we don't have a CPA today. We have some on, of course. If you could ask your questions in the in the Q and A, we have staffed even do, even during tax season. We have Dana, Matthew, Patty, Troy. I think we have Christos probably. Oops, Chris was in Pio. Pio's on. Mm -hmm. All right, Thank so Christos. we're we're still grabbing people from. Uh, uh, from the tax department, even though this is tax season and they are getting killed. Are you gonna be nice? We're always nice, we're always nice. All right, if you have questions, you can always email them in even when we're not doing this. In fact, it's where we grab our uh, questions every week or every other week is Tax Tuesday Interested Advisors. You can ask general questions there. We still answer them because we, we uh, try not to put a big paywall behind you and Getting, getting answers to questions. We get about 500 a week, so sometimes be a little patient. Uh, if you need a real detailed response on this, fact specific to you and it's giving you advice, then we're gonna say you gotta become a platinum client. Platinum client is 35 bucks a month, but they still get to ask tax questions, tax questions in writing and you get uh, as many as you want. You, you know, in those ones we ask that you do the tax in writing just because it's usually very fact specific and we don't want there to be confusion. Uh, but you can also talk to the attorneys at nauseum, pretty much. Yep. Lawyers like to talk. So <laughs> you, like to, you can always get one on. Hey, anybody there? Yes. They're excited to, to talk to you. And they don't bill you for their time. They just answer your questions. We're in the field specifically of asset protection, business planning, legacy planning. So if it's a divorce question, we're probably going to say can't help you much unless it's a tax question of all that. All right. Fast, fun, educational. We're going to have a lot of fun. Where are you from? I know that we always do this. Let's see where everybody's at. Hey, there's Anna Cordis. I see, Don, I think that you always come on. And my mom's right there on 7th Street in Anna Cordis. She walks into the Rockfish sometimes, or she used to go walk in there. She works at the Red Door, uh, which is one of the thrift marts there. All that good stuff. Let's see. Let's see. We're Kuhulu, Maui. I told you that one. New Jersey, Las Vegas, Granite Bay. New York, SoCal, San Juan, Puerto Rico. Daniel's got electricity. Uh, hopefully you guys are doing okay there. We love that area. Hope you guys are doing great. Austin, Chandler, Arizona, Houston, Texas, Beverly Hills in the house. So we have a lot of California going on. A lot of folks from Texas, there's Seattle. We're just talking about it. Uh, somebody's in, uh, is this live? Yes, I'm in uh, Tunisia or, Tun yeah, Tunisia in South Africa. Love to South Africa. I've been there, done some hunting there. People get mad at you if you go hunting there, but no, it's actually for food. Like everybody eats everything on those animals. <laughs> Honolulu, Crystal Bay. You got people from all over the place. This is awesome. So we love it. There's Reno even. And Smyrna. Is that Smyrna? Yeah, Smyrna, Georgia. Smyrna. Is that how you say it? I think so. I just butcher stuff. <clears throat> all right, so let's go over. There's Tampa, Mark. Praying for you, sir, that uh, that you guys do okay in this storm. So please be safe. Uh, we got a lot of our folks down there, like a lot of our uh, employees from Anderson actually work in the Tampa area. We got a bunch of them. So let's send out good vibes and may that storm be weakened. Uh, I'm in Tampa and you are distracting me. <laughs> Ignore the storm. It's not coming. No, it's, I, hopefully it goes to, they're saying like a category two, maybe one. They always, you know, it's always the storm surge, but hopefully you guys get a glancing blow and it, it ends up being not as big of a deal. You never know this day and age with TV, those guys like to hype it sometimes, sometimes it's not the hype. So just be safe. All right, opening questions. There's about 10 of them. Let's go over this. 
Uh, can one pick and choose properties in a cost segregation study and take bonus depreciation for multiple years? For example, can one take bonus depreciation on the five-year properties for 2021 and the 15-year properties for 2022? So we'll answer that. That's a good question, by the way. It's very specific. I have an equipment leasing company that rents equipment to my construction company and to another company that is a manufacturing plant. My CPA said the revenue is considered active. There are no employees. Would opening the equipment leasing to others remedy that? We'll go over that too. Good question so far. We rent out single family property that is on a, we rent out a single family property that is on a flat lot. Our winter rainstorms damage the foundation and make the house cold. If we buy six 200 gallon rain barrels and hardware for about $4,000, can we deduct it for 2022? Good question. We'll get into that. Would it be reasonable to group short-term rental activities? So SDR just stands for things like VRBO, Airbnb, right? So it, would it be reasonable to group Airbnb activities or short-term rental activities, including out-of-state together with a, this is a regulation. So 1.469-4 grouping and materially participate in the group. What if the out-of-state ones have a property manager? Good question there, yeah, that's right? That's a fantastic one. Yeah, this is like stump the uh, stump the tax people. <laughs> I can't answer a single question that I've seen, so I'm glad you're here. If a U.S. citizen receives a property that's located in another country as a gift, does he or she need to report it to the IRS? <laughs> if so, what paperwork is needed for it? Does a real estate gift from a parent get taxed? Then we have a long one. My question is about bonus depreciation, which I realize must be taken in the first year that the depreciable item is placed into service. The property was purchased this year and was informally placed. So we'll, we'll dive into this one. Don't worry. Some of you guys are already seeing the issue here. The property was purchased this year and was informally placed into service for a very short period of time to family and friends, but needed Reddit renovations to open it to a larger VRBO market, which we did this year. It is now placed into service. Not sure if I can qualify this year for the real estate professional or the professional real estate status designation. So uh, any chance I can use any of the bonus depreciation for next year since without the designation, I can't take a loss unless I want to carry forward. Also, I seem to remember that you have to place the property of service before the expenses are incurred to take the bonus depreciable, so depreciation. Great question. Boy, we could just do a, about, yeah, we could just do an hour on that one. That one's popping open a whole bunch of goodness. All right. How does accelerated depreciation work in general and more specifically for multifamily syndication as both a passive and non-passive investor? Ay, ay, ay. Good question. That's a good one too. What are my options if the IRS reconfigures, refigures your taxes and you have a CPA reviewing and signing off on the return? So that's, we'll have to dig into that one a little bit. Yeah. After cost segregation, how long do we need to hold the property? Is there hold time restrictions to sell after cost segregation? Or can I sell the property after cost segregation and do a 1031 exchange for tax deferred? I don't write these guys. So if you see weird typo things, sometimes we'll you know, massage it a little bit for the most part. I'm always like, hey. All right, so we're gonna ask, answer all those. If you're already having so much fun, you say, this is so much fun. I don't want it to last just an hour, an hour and a half or whatever it is. I want to get more, go to my YouTube channel. There's my smiling face. And we record all of these and put them up. We usually put the questions. So like you could tell if it's a tax Tuesday because it'll be an hour long video, generally speaking, and it'll have a whole bunch of different questions, but it's just mind food. It's, you know, it may not even be like, hey, I'm not doing a lot of rental properties, but you never know when something's going to sneak up and give you a return that you didn't anticipate. And I'll tell you what, in this day and age, the way everything's going right now, I would want every little nickel I can get my hands on. And uh, I put it into service. I don't think I would sit on cash, but I would definitely be agitating the markets right now. We've never seen, I think this is the fourth worst start of the S&P in history. It's not even the worst. <laughs> And I can tell you it made highs, new highs after all of them. All right, this is gonna be fun. Can one pick and choose properties in a cost segregation study and take bonus depreciation in multiple years? For example, can one take bonus depreciation on the five-year properties for the 2021 tax year and 15-year properties for the 2022 tax years? 
What say you, Elliot? <laughs> so you can do the five-year property on a particular property if you did a cost seg. Take all that five-year and that one property in one year, and then the rest of it in that particular property, the 10, 15, 20, would be depreciated over time. But uh, you don't have to do that for all your properties. Uh, and what you can't do is you take the five-year this year, then next year just uh, immediately bonus depreciate all the 15-year. I don't think you're allowed to do that unless maybe you're reverting back to the previous year's uh, cost seg study. Because mm -hmm. uh, I know we can go back with cost seg studies, but I'm not sure about when we break up the pieces, 5, 10, and 15 like that. Yeah, so it, what Elliot is basically saying, and not to paraphrase you, mm -hmm. but when you take a building... And specifically, when they say properties in a cost seg study, you're talking about a building. So like, let's just say we're here in a office building. This is 39 year property. I use this example all the time. So I apologize if you're like, oh, here he goes off again about carpeting. We have carpeting under our feet that your accountant would say is 39 year property. But we all know that this carpeting isn't going to make it 39 years. It, the IRS will say it's five year property, but we have to break it out. So we have to say, here's the value of the carpeting. Here's the value of, of uh, cabinets. Here's the value of the trees. You literally depreciate the trees. You depreciate the car lot, the parking lot. You get to take that over 15 years and you break these out into their pieces. So that's step number one, that's a cost set. Step number two is, do I bonus it and take it all in one year? So this is the last year of 100% bonus depreciation. So if you put a property into service in 2022, I could take any item that's five-year, seven-year, 15-year, boom, write it off in one year. But I have to pick. This is the only year I can do this. And I can choose five, seven, or 15, one or all, or none. And I could just depreciate them over five years or I could depreciate in, in one year and take bonus depreciation. In fact, I have to opt out of bonus depreciation. So that's what I think we're getting at is, hey, if I pick a property, can I do the, can I bonus 100% of the five-year property in year one and 100% of bonus depreciation on, on the seven year in year two? And the answer is no. It's the year that you decide, I, this is my five-year property, seven year, 15. It's that year that you have to take bonus depreciation or lose it and you get to opt out. But what Elliot just pointed out so smartly was that, but you could choose different properties for different years that you're gonna take the, that you're gonna do a cost seg on. So I could cost seg a property this year and I could say, hey, based off of my facts and circumstances, you could still be doing cost seg, by the way, for 2021. You, could, you Up until your return is due with extensions. So it's October 15th this year. You could make a cost seg. So you could say, hey, you know what? Do I wanna do this or not? And hmm, let me see, okay, I'll cost seg this one this year. In, in 2022, I'll cost seg another. You're allowed to do that. And then in that one, I could bonus depreciate the five-year property for property number one in, in the first year. And in the second year, I could accelerate the depreciation on the 15-year property on property two or the five, seven, and 15. I hope you're getting that. There's a lot of flexibility here. It's just on this one property, you can't do that over multiple years. So I hope that makes sense. Anything you want to add on that? No, I think that's, yeah, perfectly. It's exciting stuff, guys. <laughs> How often are you seeing bonus depreciation and more specifically cost segs come up in your- Every day your, right yeah. now, especially this time of the year, because as Toby pointed out, we still have time really to do those up until the 15th on our personal return. So this is one of those things that we still can take advantage of. And then, it's not just that we can still do it right now. It's a heavy hitter of the deductions in the tax code right now. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's very popular right now and will continue next year as well. Yep. And the bonus depreciation doesn't go away next year, just drops to 80%. So if my carpeting's worth a hundred thousand bucks in 2021, you could write off a hundred percent of it if you did a cost seg for 2021. If you did a cost seg for 2022, you could write off a hundred percent, hundred thousand dollars in 2023, you cost seg that same property and put it into service, then you're writing off 80,000 and you're writing off the 20,000 extra over five years. So it's not like, again, it's not bad. It's just, it's starting to phase down a little bit. We see a little bit of that. All right, here gets fun stuff. Equipment leasing companies, what everybody's excited to hear about. 
<coughs> I have an equipment leasing company that rents equipment to my construction company and to another company that is a manufacturing plant. So company A it rents equipment to company B and C. B and C have different owners. B is the same owners as company A that's doing the equipment leasing. My CPA said that the revenue is considered active, which company, but we'll get into that. There are no employees. Would opening the equipment leasing to others remedy that? Seems like they're focusing on the equipment leasing company. Yeah. <clears throat> so, okay. Well, I think the, the problem here is that if we are already active, assuming that's active in, to both rental units, excuse me, uh, both companies that you're renting to, adding a third is only going to further, uh, I think, bolden the fact that this is an active business because now you brought in yet another business you're doing a, a unrelated uh, leasing to this unrelated or leasing to this unrelated business, and I think that just bolsters showing that this is active income. So it's, you know, it's, you're operating against. It's not just internal, and um, so no, I think that would have the opposite effect more than likely. Yeah, well, equipment leasing is always <laughs> active, and I, I think that's the that's mm -hmm. the big thing. Is you know where where you see rents become passive is when it's rental activities. Yeah. If you're in a company that's being run by somebody else, you could possibly be passive because you're not materially participating. But I think equipment leasing is always subject to self-employment tax. Yeah. The, uh, the bigger issue here is this idea of a third party having anything to do with it. And it really doesn't. Uh, but what it could come into play is if you decide you're going to start grouping activities together. And so if you wanted to group the, manu uh, the uh, construction company and the leasing company together, you probably could. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't see if it's the same, if it's the same ownership. And I guess they always do the facts and circumstances. I don't even, we're, we're not even in passive. So I don't even know if we'd have to do it, but um, actually, I don't even think you'd have to worry about it. So I don't even have to worry about grouping. The only time I'd have to worry about grouping is if it's rental property being leased to the, to the construction company. And under those rules, it gets really wonky when you have self rental because the self rental could be considered non-passive. So most people group it. If you have an accountant that knows what they're doing, they're going to group an active business with a rental business to make the rental uh, non-passive loss offset the income from the active business. Otherwise, you could have a bad tax effect of not getting to use the, um, the, the uh, passive losses. So you could make them non-passive and all of a sudden you could have issues if you have other passive income they wouldn't offset so it's like ah so uh so the answer to this one really straightforward is it's active there's not much you can do about it but what you do is look at the type of entity so if you want to avoid getting hit with self-employment tax on all that income you might want to consider s corps making the leasing companies into something that is not subject entirely and especially if it doesn't have employees on that leasing company uh, and you're not really doing that much it might be that you take a really small salary and then all that income, it's not passive, but it's not subject to uh, social security taxes, which gets you to the same place kind of. Um, anything else on that one, sir? No, I think we're good. Pontificating too much. <laughs> we rent out a single family property that is on a flat lot. So I think what they're saying is, hey, we have a house on a really flat lot and when it rains a bunch, it, it messes up the house, it damages the foundation and makes the house cold, which is kind of odd. If we buy six 200 gallon rain barrels and hardware, we can, can we deduct it? So it sounds like they found a solution to the issue, which is to, maybe it's to keep the moisture off the ground or something. I don't know what it is. Collect the I've rain. Never, I've never <laughs> run into this, but you have a lot of rain. So you're buying barrels and hardware, can you write it off? What say you? Yes, the, the answer, uh, can we do it all in the first year? Yes, one popular thing that would pop out here, I think to a lot of people would maybe be the $2,500 de minimis selection. Uh, we're over that amount because we have 4,000, but going along that same path, uh, there is a provision that if you're, what is it, if it's under the, I think it's the lesser of $10,000 or 2% of the unadjusted basis of this property, you could add to it and probably still deduct immediately as a, yeah, I, kind of an prepare. I guess, are you assuming that this is an improvement or are you thinking that this is? I, I would think I would think it's probably not an improvement, but just in case the IRS even argued it, I think yeah. you have a perfectly good 
uh, explanation for why you could deduct it. So I don't see any problem. And what, uh, and what you just hit on was the safe harbor of $2,500. Mm -hmm. And that's per invoice or per line item on an invoice. So the line items here would be six 200 gallon rain barrels. If they're below $2,500, you're as good as gold. And then the hardware, you would break that out and you'd look at each line item uh, and you'd have to be $2,500 uh, or under $2,500 for each. Otherwise, uh, what are we writing this off? Uh, like what would be the useful life of a rain barrel? Yeah, I don't see it as an improvement, but even in the worst case scenario, I think you have a way around that. You're bonus depreciating it anyway, yeah. right? So you're, yeah. just, you're just trying to make sure that it's not an improvement. So it depends right. on what you're doing with it. If you're installing it somehow to the home and making the house more, the benefiting the home and making it more valuable, then I think you, then we'd probably have to do a cost seg and break it out. But if it's, again, if you're below that $2,500, they can't even question it. It's, it's boom, safe harbor, it's a repair, done. Don't have to think about it. And it's not $2,500 per invoice, it's $2,500 per line item on an invoice. So, you know, so assuming that the six 200 gallon rain barrels are underneath that 2,500 and the hardware is also underneath that 2,500, but they add up together around 4,000, you shouldn't have a problem. And even if it was more, I think you wouldn't have a problem. All right. Would it be reasonable, sir, <laughs> to group short-term rental activities? We're talking BRBO and Airbnb, including out-of-state properties together with a reg 1.469-4 grouping and materially participate in the group. And then the secondary question is, what if the out-of-state ones have a property manager? Yeah, this is an interesting one that uh, first of all, <clears throat> as Toby's pointing out, he keeps mentioning that we're talking about Airbnbs, uh, VRBO. We got to remember that short-term rental has a very unique, specific definition in the code. Just because you're Airbnb and something doesn't mean you're going to fit short-term rental in the, in the IRS eyes. That aside, if we're just assuming that we fit that and we're calling it short-term rental, uh, you could group if you want. You, you, the key is, and what that will allow you to do, and it's kind of bringing in the second question, you can have properties locally that you're managing yourself, meeting all the criteria for. Um, and But then you have this one outlier that maybe is across the country and mm. you have another property manager. Well, on its own, you may not qualify with that one property, but by grouping, you could probably pull it into the, into the, uh, uh, the fold there and, and then do exactly what you're trying to do here, I think, with depreciation probably. Yeah, so what's a reg? It's just the IRS's interpretation of what the tax code is. Yeah, so the, the code <laughs> provision here is 469, which mm -hmm. is passive activity loss rules. So we're talking about passive activities. A short-term rental can be a passive activity if you don't materially participate. So the only question here is, are you materially participating on your short-term rental activities as a group? And what we know for sure is that when you have rental property and rentals are anything eight days or above, I'm not going to get into the substantial services and extraordinary services and all that. Just figure in real life, eight days and above average tenant. So if you're renting it out, then we have to group those all together if we're going to be a real estate professional because we have to, our material participation is per property unless we group them. So here we're just saying, hey, this is short term rentals. This is not a rental activity underneath the code as far as it is not a passive activity by itself. It is a trader business. So can we group a number of these? And just, I always say pizza parlors, right? Every time somebody says short-term rental, I say pizza harbor. In fact, you like to make fun of that, right? Every time it gives me an example. It's I, was Toby's, I was actually going to make a t-shirt. Toby's <laughs> and, and Pizza. may still do it. Okay. Right. So each short-term rental is really a pizza parlor and it's an operating business. And the only question is, am I materially participating? So this is no different than if I have a bunch of pizza parlors. Generally speaking, in a pizza parlor, you're going to wrap them all up in, into one entity. You're probably going to have a parent company. In the short-term rental, we probably want those losses to hit us. So we're, we might group them up through a partnership. We might group them up through a disregarded entity. But at the end of the day, it's you. So you need to make that election to group all of those short-term rentals. And it's only for purposes of material participation. This has nothing to do with real estate professional status. 
because it's a short-term rental activity. We do not care. You do not, it's not a, it, it is not a rental activity that is considered passive. It is a trader business. It's a pizzeria. And the only issue is, did I materially participate? And the reason that I want material participation is to make it non-passive so that that loss could be used against all my other types of income. That's it. So if I have a bunch of Airbnbs and I know, oh yeah, I could offset my W-2 income. I could do this great tax mm -hmm. maneuver and I'm just using the tax laws in my favor. And I'm like, yes. But he says, if you eat too much pizza, you'll look like a hog and get slaughtered. John, stop <laughs> that. John, John's misbehaving again. But um, anyway, all we're doing is saying, hey, we want to use these in our favor in this particular year, right? Again, the way the cost sags and everything else work is these short-term rentals, we could pick sometime in the future. Hey, I have a lot of W-2 income. Maybe it's not this year. Maybe it's next year. And then, boom, I can, I can unlock a whole bunch of depreciation and it's group my activity together, my short-term rentals together, which is really, I think there's four provisions. It's common ownership, the, the nature of the activity, mm -hmm. all that fun stuff, geographical proximity, all that stuff. You can lump them together and say, all right, here's this one business that I'm running and materially participating in. Now I have a non-passive ordinary loss that I can use to offset my W-2 income. And that's why people love short-term rentals from a tax standpoint. Just seeing if there's anything in the chat. All I, see, I keep seeing just Patty. I'm going to expand this. So bear with me, guys. There we go. Patty taking it over. If you have a group of rentals for material participation, how is that election made? It's actually something you do on your return. You're literally just saying we're making a grouping election. The mechanics of it. Do I still report them separately? Yes. You still report them separately, but you treat them all. So, Rosie, you treat them all as one activity. And you're just making, you're literally, you're putting like, what, a little statement on your return? Yeah, there's a state, there, there actually will be a statement for aggregation on that, that you'd make on your return. And you just glued them all together, but you do report them all independently. Yeah. So you treat the group of the activity. So those rental losses, usually what you, your reason you're doing it, and I wouldn't make a grouping election on rental property that you have a whole bunch of loss carry forward on mm -hmm. because it locks it, but you're looking at it going, all right, let's see. I'm a real estate professional. Here's if I make this designation and I could choose not to, or I could choose to, uh, boy, oh boy, I could, I could do myself some good. Let's see. Uh, and just remember Rosa that pulls in all of your rental activity, even syndications mm -hmm. and it's, it's an all or nothing. Somebody says, does the short-term rental need to be within your own town or can it be a condo? It could be anywhere if you're grouping them. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you want to materially participate, then you have to meet the test. There's, there's seven tests that you could meet any of them. The most common one, if, if, if it's in your hometown and you're the one managing it, you don't have to worry about anybody else. If you have a property manager that's doing it, then the question is, do you and a spouse do more than 100 hours a year in more than anybody else? And, uh, you know, and the way the court trips people is property managers don't track time. So the, the real one there is probably closer to the 500 hour test. So you and a spouse meeting 250 hours each. So 500 hours total would, would meet the material participation test on a yearly basis. And boom, you don't have to worry. You could have property managing, you could be all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Can you materially participate in short-term rental using property managers if you meet the more than hundred hour rule? I think we just said that Felipe, but Technically, yes, but you'd want to make sure that that property manager is documenting who's doing what on your property. Just because if you're asked, the IRS is going to say, who else did substantial services? Let's see. And it's not the company. It's the actual employee for that company. So, you know, Johnny and, and Sal over here were the cleaners. How often did they clean your property? How many hours? Okay, we add that up. Oh, yeah, they did 30 hours. All right. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, I did hundred hours and it's way more than everybody else. I'm good. But if it's, Hey, but we also had these other guys doing a lot of work on your properties. These ones over here, they did uh, 110 hours. Okay. Now, I, now, now, I'm trouble. now I have trouble. I need to show how many hours I did and how many hours they did and that I did more. Cool. Is that the person, not the company? It's the person. Yep. So you're already out. If you buy a rental property together, wife is real estate agent, husband is not, can he still be considered active? Yeah, 
Absolutely. It's a, it, it's per couple and you add your times together to meet the material participation. The issue is it sounds like your wife would probably be a real estate agent, would be a real estate professional, and she would meet the first test, which is 750 hours, more than 50% of her time. Um, it's under 469C7. And if I'm not mistaken on this reg, it's uh, 1.469-4C2. That is the provision you're probably actually triggering here to do the grouping election, which is what you put on your return. Mm -hmm. I'm making a grouping election pursuant to such and such. And just for technicality here, grouping is very different than aggregation, although there's, there's similar concepts. But aggregation is going to be with your long-term rentals, and we're pulling all your long-term rental activity into one big group. Grouping is where you have different businesses that you're trying to find similarity with and put them together for material participation purposes. Good enough. All right. Tax and asset protection workshops coming up on October 1st. Is that this weekend? Yes. Are we already so. into October. We're there almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going fast. This year it's just been like. Whoosh, whoosh, yeah. Whoosh. Psh, psh. <laughs> yeah, it's getting towards the end of September. We're in tax season. Everybody's like, oh, they've been getting crunched. Uh, somebody says earlier, you mentioned it's not too late to do a cost seg for 2021. If, if the 2021 tax is already filed without cost seg, can you amend them and do it? Yes, Kevin, this is why you're here. And can you do the bonus depreciation? What would the deadline to amend? Is it October 15th? It's actually October 17th this year. Do it. And if you need a good cost seg person, we will make sure like Ian's in this. What's yeah. Ian doing? He's I know, supposed I to be just he's buried right now. He's he's like can't he's it's like irresistible. He's like, oh, there's <laughs> questions. Somebody needs to answer them. I think so, it takes his mind off things for a so, bit. <laughs> so Kevin, I would I would be curious, Kevin, if you would be willing to share once we are done how much it saved you in 2021. Just to just send us an email to our tax Tuesday and just say, hey, by the way, it saved me like. 15 grand or whatever it is that you're going to save because of that. Cause it just tells you why you show or stick around and listen to this stuff because you never know when it's going to save you some money. And it's like a nice vacation that it's going to save you. Right. All right. Tax and asset protection workshop. My partner, Clint Coons does the morning. I do the afternoons uh, and he does a great job on asset protection of security through obscurity, creating a great plan, keeping your stuff out of the reach of, uh, all the nasties out there, lawyers, snoops, Uncle Sam. I do tax in the afternoon. We work just on real estate. We're gonna show you how to build a great blueprint, a uh, great plan to help you create a legacy. This is fun. Uh, does the short-term rental period consider who it was rented to? If someone stayed three different times, you're fine. It's unique rentals. So they're always looking at it. So if you rented it, you know, again, they, the way the IRS says is you take all the days that you rented it out as a short term rental and divide it by the unique rentals. So, you know, I don't I don't I think that if you had somebody stay three days in a row and you had three different rentals, they would they, they would say no. But if you had somebody stay three days this week, three days next month, three days the other, they're going to break that up. All right. I'm just answering questions. Sorry, guys. Sometimes I just read the chat. It's right in front of my face and I can't help myself. All right, here's a good one. If a US citizen receives a property that's located in another country as a gift, so uh, let's say it's Spain, and you get some, you, you get a you get a, a villa in Marbella. Ooh, nice. you're <laughs> like, oh, okay, I'm doing good. Does he or she need to report it to the IRS? Let's just answer that one first. Well, probably at that dollar value, yes. But typically, no, you, I, there's, first of all, it's not gonna be tax, but you may have to report it if, it was, if it's over $100,000. Uh, you just fill out a form, but you're not going to be taxed on it. Uh, though, if you do get over that hundred thousand dollar mark, every gift that's over five thousand, you have to individually list out. But there's no tax. So, if you receive a gift, you have to list it on your return, or is it just from foreign sources? Well, well if, if it's from foreign sources, sources, and it's over a hundred thousand, then we need to report, but we're not paying any tax. Not paying any tax is the only part you need to know. What yeah. <laughs> paperwork is needed for it? Again, it's a, a, yeah, it's a, it's a form I actually attached. wrote that down. I think it's a form 3052 or something like that. Yeah, so you can make sure that you're getting it. Does the real estate gift from a parent get taxed? Not by you. What's weird is if I can give Elliot here 
half a million dollars. He pays no tax on it. I do. On a grantor. Unless I choose to use my lifetime exclusion, which right now is sitting at around 12 million bucks. So I can give away a lot of money. So let's turn that one around. Elliot can give me a half million dollars. Yeah, <laughs> and then I'd have 11 million to work with, 12 million. I'm a little bit light on that right now, but yeah. <laughs> but, but it is, uh, for the foreign reporting, it is form 3520, 3520. In the U.S., if it's a U.S. Uh, individual giving a gift to another, again, you might fill out, a, and I always get this mixed up, it's either 707 or 709, but there's just forms. That's all you do is you don't have to report it, but there isn't any tax unless we're over the level. You can always receive stuff. That's mm -hmm. the thing. There's a few states that have inheritance taxes still, but that's yeah, about it. But that's, that's only when there's death. But if you're, uh, it, it, when, when we're gifting, well, maybe there's one that triggers on the state side, but on the federal side, mm -hmm. it's never taxable. And there's very few in instances where I think a state gets involved. So we like that. Yeah. All right. Long ass question. <laughs> My question is about bonus depreciation, which I realize must be taken in the first year that the depreciable item is placed into service. Mm. Kind of, right? Yeah, a little bit, right? A little correct. Yeah. Little I could choose my account. Like I could have a property for five years and I could choose to, you know, to change it to county method under the 3115 mm -hmm. and say, we're going to cost seg it. That's the year that I have to do the bonus depreciation. So technically not quite. It's the first year that I break out that property, then I have to take bonus and I'm supposed to take it or opt out. Now, I would have to go back to the bonus depreciation rule for that year that I put, put it in service, though. So that's one thing that uh, that might be where we're getting caught on this first year part. Yep. Um, the property was purchased this year and was informally placed into service for a very short period of time to family and friends, but it needed renovations to open it up to a larger VRBO market which we did this year it's now placed in service when i see families and friends i always think personal yeah it's if i rent to somebody under mar market value and if i rent to somebody that's a family member that's personal use i don't get to depreciate it and what yeah what happens is you're going to add up all these personal use days you're going to all have all the true fair market rental days and if you're at the, I think it's the greater 14 day, over 14 days or 10% of the fair market rental days uh, that you've used it personally, then you're going to be limited to your deductions up to the amount of income that you actually received. And so you mm -hmm. could really do yourself a disservice. Yeah, you're not going to get the loss. So let's just say you were using it for personal services. And this is the reason I'm going to say that is like, all right, now it's placed into service. Now this is the year that we care about. We're 100% bonus depreciation. We're not sure if we qualify this year for professional real estate status. We don't have to worry about that if this is VRBO in your seven days or less average use. Because if you average less than seven days or less, it's a pizza shop. It's a trader business. It's no different than any other business. You don't have to worry about professional real estate status. It's real estate professional status. Any chance I can use any of the bonus depreciation for next year, since without the designation, I can't take the loss unless I want to carry forward. The answer is yes. Yep. What you would do is, hey, we would just treat it as 20 or 39 year property since it's a VRBO. So I would treat it as its typical process. If it was single family, it'd be 27 and a half or residential, it'd be 27 and a half years. But this is 39 years, right? Because it's... Mm -hmm considered excuse me hotel um i could just wait till next year i could do a cost seg on it and take all the bonus depreciation next year absolutely you could and it's but remember you don't have to qualify as a real estate professional so all we care about is did you materially participate did you do all the activities were you the host if the answer is yes we don't have to worry about anything else if the answer is no, then we go to step two, which is, did you do 100 hours? Did anybody do more? If the answer is yes to that, I did 100 hours, but somebody did more, then we'd go to the 500 hours. And if you met that, then we don't care about anybody else. So this is VRBO, is vacation rentals by owner. It's like an Airbnb, Mary. Um, any chance I can use? Yes. Also, I, wanted, I, I, I seem to remember that you have to place the property in service before expenses are incurred to take bonus depreciation. That's correct. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Before it's depreciable, that's we put it to service. Because we don't depreciate our personal property. 
So the easiest way to think about this is if I bought a house and I was living in it, I don't depreciate it. But if I moved out of that house and made it into a rental, then I could. Yay. Perfect. How does accelerated depreciation work, Elliot? <laughs> in general, and more, this sounds like a law exam. Yeah. <laughs> How does de accelerated depreciation work? Discuss. You have three pages. Uh, in general, and more specifically for a multifamily syndication as both a passive and non-passive investor. You know, to, to really prep for this question, I actually went back and, and tried to come up with the actual definition of accelerated depreciation, which just simply means you're deducting more up front than you are at the end. Uh, it, it, that's the it's basic bonus depreciation. Yeah, it, bonus it depreciation is certainly a part of that, but there's other types of, you know, out there uh, depreciation. Here's a good question. Jamaya. There is bonus depreciation in California for federal tax purposes. Mm -hmm. They will not allow you to take bonus for state tax purposes. So you end up with two returns. Very good question there. Yeah, yeah. 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 California sucks. Two different trails, <laughs> yeah. No there. offense, but your tax department, like the franchise tax board is a bunch of vampires. And if yeah. you're listening, <laughs> go back into your coffins because you know that you are. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of folks that worked for the Service. We had mm. tax attorneys that worked for them, and, and they even say like, "Yeah, it's pretty." It was pretty brutal. Yeah, <laughs> it's like most people are like, "Yeah, we're pretty, we're pretty vicious." It's the truth. It's a bunch of you guys. So I can say it. I love you guys. I probably know to, never be allowed to go back into California again. But <laughs> holy kashmoli, you guys are vicious. I'll be checking for Toby at the border. I want that team like coming after my enemies. <laughs> you go after them. You just <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so anyway, accelerated depreciation is a fancy way of saying anything that's five, seven, 15 years, anything that's 20 years or below for useful life, you can write off in one year. It's under 168K. So I can, boom, take this huge deduction. Now, how does it work for a multifamily syndication? It doesn't, unless you do a cost seg. And if I do a cost seg, I'm breaking out the personal property, which is 1245 property. Mm -hmm. That's just for the accountants out there versus the 1250 structural property. Yep, your, so, your real personal, your personal property and your real property, 1245 per, personal property, 1250 being your real property. Right, and we never, do, we never get to write off land. So it's whatever's built on that land. So you walk up to this beautiful apartment complex, you walk in this little alleyway or the walkway and it has a nice little fence and it's got some palm trees. You walk out there, there's a pool and you see all this little cute little gates and all this stuff. All that stuff is 15 year property for the most part. Like all that you could write off yep. in one year. Oof. So that creates a big loss. Now, the only question is, are you a material participant in that, in that syndication? And if the answer is no. no, then the next question is, are you a real estate professional? If the answer is no, then it's passive. If the answer to either of those first two questions, are you active in the management, are you materially participating, then it's non-passive. Are you a real estate professional, then it's non-passive. Otherwise, yes, it's passive activity. If you aggregate, <laughs> which we talked about well, earlier. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Even on that, on that one property, if I didn't, if I materially, if I was a general partner mm -hmm. on a, in a syndication, then it doesn't matter whether I aggregate Correct. or not, that would be non-passive loss shooting down. Yep. If I'm a real estate professional, then I would have to aggregate my properties together to, to meet the material participation test. Which if I was a real estate pro, then it unlocks the loss there as non-passive. Mm -hmm. Yes. Somebody says, California is like watching the Titanic go down over two decades. <laughs> it's still a beautiful state. <laughs> oh, know? yeah. And it's, it's just, yeah. it's beautiful there. But man, you're, oh, yeah, yeah. We're gonna be nice. We're not gonna say anything. <laughs> I love going fishing out of San Diego. Wow. And uh, you guys, down. Napa Valley is amazing. The beaches are gorgeous. It's just, you have a little, you have a little bit of a- Tax problem. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's kind of like that. Your family's great, except you got that one uncle. Drinks too much, and uses colorful language. And you're like, everything's great. This is a great holiday, but- but Uncle Elliot, yeah, <laughs> Uncle Elliot getting hammered, <laughs> talking some crap, right? That's the problem. So yeah, California is beautiful. You just got a little, 
That's why I missed my uh, imitation to Thanksgiving last year. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna skip it. I'm gonna skip it. Yeah, you really, I can't see you ever being bad ever. You're like the nicest guy on the planet. Like Elliot's truly the nicest guy that's out there. I can't see you ever misbehaving. All right. What are my options if the IRS refigures your taxes and you have a CPA reviewing and signing off on the return? Well, the tax liability is always the responsibility of the taxpayer. So it really doesn't matter if a CPA messed something up or didn't, gave you bad information or didn't, yeah. whatever it is, the liability is yours as an individual. And then if you don't agree with it, mm -hmm. that's where you get to go to the Office of Internal Appeals mm -hmm. and you say, hey, I don't agree with this. Let's take a look at it. You're going to get a real professional looking at your information then. So it's not uncommon to have an examiner. Uh, you remember Ronnie? Yeah. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> Ronnie, let me see if I can actually look this up in real time. So Ronnie had a client. He was going through an audit. And Ronnie is uh, with Hager. He's a great CPA, a great friend of ours. And uh, used to work here. And let me see what he says. Oh, this is great. There. He was like, he said he was in this, in this uh, audit. And some inexperienced guy asked questions like, what airline do you travel on and what hotel do you stay in? <laughs> so after like 90 minutes of asking questions, some new guy pops up and starts yelling that the a shareholder loan is a dividend. We're like, um, who are you? He was so combative. <laughs> Said it was an awkward 10 minutes. These were two of his statements. Don't cite code sections at me. I represent the interests of the government. I don't care the way you see it. <laughs> Sometimes you get that auditor. We've seen that. It's rare, but holy cow, when you get one, it's like, just, you know what? Just figure out what you're going to say, sir, ma'am, whatever. Just tell me what it is that you think I owe. And then I'm going to ignore you and go straight to your boss. No reason to engage. Yes. That. <laughs> Sometimes it's just better to be like, you know what? You're right. Bad me. No, the CPAs will just be like, they're going to tear into each other, yeah. you know, but for the most part, sometimes you get an idiot. The smart you, play is to quote it like he, like Ronnie did yeah. laugh about it, but get out of that as fast as you yeah. can and file your Ronnie's like, go ahead and make your feel. decision. That, that's what he's going to say. Go ahead and do it. Don't worry. Like if it's us, we always, we back our return. So like, we'll fight, like we'll fight on your behalf. We don't charge you. So you're like, you know what, just go ahead. Throw it out there. We'll go to the Office of Internal Appeals. We'll talk to somebody who knows what they're doing that yeah. actually, you know, respects the law. And uh, but I've seen some bad ones. We had like a that's horrible. Yeah, that's poor guy came in with a seventy nine thousand dollar tax liability, and his CPA rolled over on him. It was like completely docile kitty, you know, just lying on his belly. And and we took it. It was like you're just absolutely dead wrong. Like here's all the things. We just appe appeal. Boom, done. It took like two two months. It was annoying. But I think the liability was fifteen hundred bucks, two thousand when it was done. It's just, just know that sometimes that happens. So, yes. So IRS reconfigures your taxes. You want to find out why, because they're doing it for a reason. Usually, it's because somebody sent a ten ninety nine, or something was reported underneath your Social Security number, and it could be incorrectly reported. It could be a transcribed number. It could be somebody that was just wrong. Maybe they gave you a gross number instead of a net number. There's a number of reasons, but sometimes the IRS gets bad information and you just want to see what their information is. Then you meet and you meet with the agent, determine whether or not they're taking a position that's contrary to yours and whether you can rectify it. Then you get to go to the Office of Internal Appeals. If they, if you still don't like what they're saying, then you go to the tax court. And I'll tell you this, if you go to tax court, they do not want you in tax court. They absolutely want to settle these things if humanly possible, unless it's something where they really do need court guidance. Like, I don't know if it's A or B. Nobody knows whether it's A or B. Hey, court, will you tell us whether it's A or B? Well, the courts go to the law clerks to do the research. <laughs> yep. You clerked for judges. I clerked for judges. <laughs> you should not be listening to the, what the, the law clerks say for the most part. You shouldn't be listening oh, to what the judges is say. Is this recorded? Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> All right. After cost segregation, how long do we need to hold the property? Is there a hold time restriction to sell after cost segregation? Or can I sell the property after cost segregation and do a 1031 exchange for tax deferred? Question marks. What I really say? like this question because there, you know, you're going to hear a lot of stuff out there. Well, it should be this long or, you know, common sense is this long or whatever. The reality is the code doesn't say anything. 
Okay, it doesn't say there's no time given for how long you have. You just have to have it in a trader business or as an mm -hmm. investment. Yeah, I will say this, that if you cost SAG a property and you sell it, and let's say you did it after one year, you're going to have four years of recapture on the five-year property if you bonused all of it. You're going to have 14 years of recapture on the 15-year property. You're going to have six years of recapture on the seven. Mm -hmm. And that recapture is taxed as ordinary income. Um, so that, like, that's number one is that there could be a tax implication, but if you 1031, don't worry about it. If you have an investment property, there's nothing that says I can't cost seg it and roll it into another property. Just know that if you do, you need to keep the same tax methodology. In other words, you have to cost seg the new property and write off its 1245 property separately from its 1250 property. Uh, somebody says, by the way, my IRS tax auditor spelled his title wrong. He wrote operations manager. <laughs> I still had to pay an arm and a leg after his <laughs> audit. <laughs> operations. That's mean. Yeah, that's, that's everybody this time of year in taxes. <laughs> I, I misspell my name half the time at this point. Sometimes I'm just lucky to be able to see. I'm like, uh, what's, what's Toby? You misspelled your name again. Spell check. Right. Right. Um, it just says Hefe. <laughs> Toby keeps going to El Hefe. I don't know why. All right. Uh, this is my first year in business, so I have not filed the tour. Oh, somebody's already answering that. By the way, I just want to say a big shout out to Troy, who manages our bookkeeping department, and Dana, and Matthew, and Patty, and Ian and Pio and Christos who've been answering questions. There's 125 written questions that have been answered, which is pretty amazing. So I have to say, give props where props are due. Those guys are in the middle of tax season and they're doing this. So they get a big star. You don't realize how bad tax season can be. Your tax professionals, it has been so tough dealing with the IRS. I know that the Inflation Reduction Act gets made fun of because it doesn't really stop inflation and we're going to have 87,000 new agents or whatever. We need investment into the IRS. I can just tell you as a tax professional, yeah. I don't know if you feel the same uh, way. Yeah, totally. We need more people working for the IRS that could actually help because you can't get a question answered half the time. And uh, it took us about a year to get a paper return response. They would take your check and then they would say you still owed the money. So it's absolutely catastrophic what's going on in that place. So I don't begrudge the money i do begrudge that if they're going to give it to a bunch of examiners to audit poor people i think that sucks that's who they audit by the way the vast majority of audits is people that are working class or or or, or, or lower it sucks they shouldn't be doing it but they get a good return on their investment when they send out those letters and audit the earned income tax credits and the people that are making twenty five thousand dollars and below they can't afford an account to fight it and they're usually scared to death of the irs so they just pay it so it's uh, versus the folks that can have a guys like us defend them. It's a completely different animal. Uh, all right. Uh, if you guys like tax knowledge, if you like this type of information, please go in there and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Patty always shares out the, uh, the, the, the link. It's, we also stream the Tax Tuesdays. If you want to watch it through a different format, you go to YouTube and, 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 and watch it. You could also watch the videos there. And there's a ton of stuff. Put about three videos a week, usually two at least, three sometimes. And I'm always trying to pick topics. You could always help me out. And one of the things you could do is go to Tax Tuesday to Anderson Advisors and let me know a topic that you want me to do a deep dive into. Ask your questions. This is where we pick our questions. We, again, we get about 500. I just randomly go in. It's usually like the top. <laughs> I literally look at the top bunch of questions and I'll be like, oh, those ones all look good. Just grab them and throw them in. Just make sure that they make a little bit of sense. Um, so you could always go in there and ask your questions. I personally think that it's one of the most beneficial use of your time is to learn these rules. And it's not necessarily you that you might be helping. It may be somebody that you care about. It may be somebody that you meet. It may be a friend. It may be a family member or somebody else where you just say, hey, you know what? You might want to look at this. I heard yep. you might be able to do something that can help yourself. Big, big difference, especially in years like now. Like people don't realize that the wash sale rule doesn't apply to crypto. So you can sell your crypto and immediately buy it back, have this huge capital loss, offset a bunch of your capital gains, especially if you had to sell some property or sell uh, stock uh, during this last year. Maybe, maybe you took a bunch of winners and 
your uh, financial professional said, we're out of the market, dumped it, and you have all this gain, there's, there's a freebie to help offset it. It's just knowing little things like that so that you can better yourself and you don't get smacked with the tax stick. Anything from you, sir? And I think we, we're determined next time it's going to be with some bookkeeping element to it. Yeah, right? we're going to try to do next uh, Tax Tuesday as a bookkeeping special. So if you have bookkeeping questions specifically, ta- you know, send them on in. Say, I have a bookkeeping question. That'll help me identify that it's a bookkeeping question. But I have no doubt that we have a ton already in there. But if you do the, uh, the Tax uh, Tuesday next time in two weeks, we're going to have Troy butler on and we're going to just we're just going to focus like a laser beam on books and records because your PL and balance sheets actually matter in fact the more the time that you spend on those things the better off your business is going to be because it's going to tell you the actual financial health of your business as opposed to guessing and waiting till the end of the year or like me six months after the end of the year like okay let's make sure my books are actually done right you want to actually kind of be doing this stuff as you go so you can get a good idea of the health of your business because there's nothing worse than that surprise of like hey i ran out of money i wonder why that kind of sucks <laughs> it has a chilling effect on your weekend activities <laughs> all right there's still a few questions that are open we'll continue to answer those but in the meantime i just want to thank everybody for joining us for tax tuesday and we will see you in two weeks anything else no thanks for uh let me attend and uh, we'll see you. Uh, Elliot kicks some hiney. He does a great <laughs> job. So I just want to say thanks to Elliot. Thanks yeah, for the whole team on doing another tax Tuesday. You guys do a fantastic job. And thanks, thank, guys. Thanks to the clients. Yeah, absolutely. Without you guys, we'd be talking to ourselves. <laughs> Which we always do anyway. <laughs> All right.